let me give it up to this sister who, um, how many of you have somebody in your life or know people that as soon as they get up in the morning and then, I don't know, 12, 14, 16 hours later are still going? How many of you? That's this sister. Where you're like, I didn't, I'm not doing enough with my life. <laughs> but I'm a good napper. <laughs> Uh, so thank you. So I want to talk about uh, your work. Is that cool? That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm it's excited. Been, it's been nice to get to know you. Thank you. And you too. Thank you, sister. Um, so we're actually not going to talk about your exhibit, but I think everybody should go and see the work in that exhibit. Um, because what you did, um, and for all of us, is that Latoya Ruby Frazier was inspired by you. She had you on her mind for two years right. to do this work. Um, but I want to go back a little bit in time and talk about uh, what you were doing in jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was in the Allegheny County Jail for five years. Um, <laughs> and that came about because I went to a community meeting in Homewood. And Homewood is a neighborhood in the city of Pittsburgh. It's about five miles east of the city center. It's a low-income, predominantly black neighborhood that in the 1990s became gang-infested with related uh, violence and crime. And it, I had always admired the work of authors like Wally Lamb and Sonia Sanchez and others who went into the prisons and taught creative writing. So when I went to this community meeting, and the community was saying, we need jobs, we need safety, we need police protection, we need income opportunities. A young man who was about 25, I'd say, stood up and said, I can't get a job. He's 25. I'm a convicted felon. And any time I go to look for a job, I have to check that box on the employment application. My opportunities go away. And I thought to myself, but if you were self-employed, you wouldn't have to check a box. And many writers are self-employed, freelancers. So I says, okay, I'm gonna go down and see if I can teach creative writing at the Allegheny County Jail. Um, could you say a little bit uh, more about uh, this image? Because uh, I like what you played around with. Yeah. Um, this is an Im image of the bridge that goes from the Allegheny County Courthouse to where the jail, the building where people have been housed in the jail for a century. And my thought was, flip this photograph, and instead of going down into the jail, how about taking the people who've been convicted and going up, you know, offering opportunities to um, improve, to, to have better lives, to serve their time for whatever crimes that they did. But when they come out, what kind of people are they going to be? So you, uh, you had to make me a believer and perhaps others. How many of you think that the creative arts can help reduce recidivism? people returning back to prison. Just raise your hand. All right. The, there are a lot of moles that you've planted in this crowd. Uh, so tell me, what it's, what's resonating in the community? Why do you think uh, the creative arts can do that? What they found is that um, when people who are incarcerated have arts programs, available to them, and especially creative writing, they have to empathize. And many people haven't done that. They've committed the crimes, they've stolen, they've robbed, they've whatever they've done, because they weren't really feeling for the other people. But when you write a story, and that characters are going to come true, you've got to step into those other characters and understand what's, what they're like which is an aspect of penance, which is the root of the word penitentiary, is that you understand what other people are going through and what 
you have done to them, what you could to, to do to them. So as a result, the, the state of California has done the research, as have other states, and found that over a seven-year period, people who committed, who were released from jail, did not come back. And the rate of recidivism where people do come back got lower and lower the longer these people were out. Yeah, beautiful. So in the land of the free, we have one of the largest uh, population of prisoners in the world. Yeah. And not just looking at that number, but you also talk about this idea about the collateral damage of incarceration. Can you say more about that? Right. This picture says it all. It's not just that a man or a woman goes to jail or prison. Their children, their families, even the community is affected. And although we might think, well, the community is better off with them locked up, the community also suffers a loss. The family suffers a loss. And what they found is the children of people who've been incarcerated have a higher likelihood of becoming offenders as an adult than the regular population. Beautiful. Um, t what kind of genres of writing did you have in prison? Because I, I see in you know, some of the slides that are some may of the come up or may not. <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> I like a little love for the TARDIS reference. Thank you. Um, so you did some work at Westinghouse High School. You talked about some of these persons. What kind of work did you do? I, I know you were talking about some of uh, the yeah. books, the pieces that you wrote. Yeah. Or not just you wrote, but the community of writers. Right. Well, when I went in, bam, 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 let me in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my goal was to teach poetry, fiction, essay, and memoir. And by learning the rules, conforming to the rules required of, of writing according to those different styles, their reward would be that they would be published. And the very first uh, book that we did, um, when I first went to the jail, I refused to work with the men. I had seen several documentaries that scared the daylights out of me about. <laughs> so, and then I get in there, and the guys are all over the place, walking through the halls and everything, smiling. How are you doing, miss? I knew some of them. You know? <laughs> So one guy came in my class one day and said, I know where you live. You're across the street from my cousin. I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in this class with the ladies, they were always willing. But one day, after I'd been teaching the class for about four weeks, they came in and they all came in down, slumped. And I says, what's going on? And they said, Miss Sandra, who's going to want to read anything we have to write? And so we had to have a conversation. First was to get over this uh, concept that when you write, it's going to be right the first time you write it. So we had to clear up the notion that everybody's first draft is crappy. <laughs> Tony Morrison, whoever, you know, it's crappy. The second was the concept that have you ever heard that a diamond is just a chunk of coal that made good under pressure? And so as they're sitting there thinking of themselves perhaps as chunks of coal, I says, yeah, but under pressure, that coal can become a diamond. And one of the ladies says, you know what, Miss Sandra? We're diamonds in the rough. <laughs> That's going to be the name of our book and everything sailed from then on. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. We, uh, once I started working with the guys, you know, they had to meet strict requirements. They would not be published just because they were in the class. Probably we've all had experiences like that in high school. No, there were, you had to write, polish, edit, proofread, we handled it just as though they were going to submit that work to the New Yorker or the um, Missouri Review or the Atlantic. They earned their right to be in there, which also was stimulating. Part of this involves the fact of what happens when people are intellectually stimulated. 
which was one of the amazing things I found with, when I started working with incarcerated populations. The first time was with um, young men who were who, juveniles who were sentenced to the Abraxas Academy in lieu of being sent to a corrections detention center. And I go in there t with these young criminals, and they're marvelous. They're marvelous. I was teaching them photography, and they were so eager to do the creative problem solving, to say, let's figure out how we light this. Let's figure out how we work with this chemistry. Let's figure out how we expose these cameras. And um, that's when I first realized it's the intellectual s stimulation, it's the creative problem solving, positively applied, that makes a difference. Then I went on to Westinghouse, which was in chaos at that time, Westinghouse High School in Homewood. At least one student in my class was a gang member. I knew he was, and he was a leader. He was belligerent, he was tough, but when I gave the class a word game challenge, boggle, he passed out dictionaries and says, we're gonna do this. It was the intellectual challenge, the intellectual stimulation, and the same thing happened here. And everybody listened to him when he said, go get Boggle. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> a new superpower. Um, so if, I want to finish this sentence as we kind of bring this to a close and then also connect this work to how this has manifested in the, the future with some of your students. But if someone were to say, why should my tax dollars go to pay for a criminal's creative writing process or creative arts? You would say because it makes the world a better place and a safer place. The very reason you want these people in prison is so that society is safer. But 95% of the people who go to prison will be released one day. And how do we want them to come out? Bitter, angry, criminal behavior reinforced by associations? Or do we want these people to come out with a sense of purpose and hope and maybe there's something I can do. Their humanity has been maintained through empathy and the process of penance. So what do we want our prisons to do and our jails to do? What do we want them to build bridges to? Beautiful. And here you have examples of how some of my students felt about the opportunities that they had. Thank you, sister. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your work. Um, might we all be part of a lineage, right? We all are a part of a lineage um, of sharing our work, and what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And you did this work five or six years ago? Yes, I, at the end of, um, I, did, I was in the jail from 2004 to 2010. At that point, um, I gifted the program to Chatham University. They were looking for an opportunity to get into corrections I was leaving. I had promised to go. I promised to go to jail for five years. <laughs> they let me keep coming back. I keep coming back for five years. Chatham has taken up the program. Their graduate writing program under Cheryl St. Germain has taken this up, carried it forward, and are doing a wonderful job. And I hope that other, others continue to do the same, as inspired in the beginning by people like Wally Lamb, and Sonia Sanchez and the other great writers who Beautiful. Brought in. Um, so there is a lineage holder here of this work, and that is Eric Boyd. Yes. So I'm going to step off the stage. Okay. And why don't you bring that brother forward to share his work? Gladly. All right. In fact, Eric's signature is on here. The thank you for everything. And it's, Eric was one of my students, um, and uh, I'm endlessly proud of, of him as a talent. And, and what he's doing with his work, and this is the real treat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before I get started, two things. One, I know you gave her two rounds of applause here, me a half of one. You gave her one and a half rounds of applause. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be here tonight um, 
whether on this stage or, or, or possibly in this situation at all, if it weren't for this woman. So I'd really like another round of applause for her. And Eric, Eric made it all worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Um, today I'm going to share a, a, well, a truncated version of an excerpt of a novel that I'm starting. <laughs> so in the scheme of things, it's a, you know, a drop, but um, if any of you like the truncated version of the excerpt, blah, 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 uh, there are full versions of that excerpt under your chairs if you haven't seen them already. And um, thank you to CDI Printing for making them, a.k.a. my mother who works there. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> the Red Bridge Motel. I'm in a motel in Kansas City taking a shower which I've barely done since I started train hopping. The manager eyed me suspiciously, but his idea of a single girl checking into a room is probably she's somebody's mistress or worse. But still, that's better than saying, hi, I'm Farah, I'm basically a hobo, and I'm getting a room to meet another girl tonight. In the shower, the water's so hot that the last few hundred miles melt off of me. I sit in the tub, tuck my knees up and rest my head, letting the water run down my back. I hope Audrey comes, but she probably won't. I started train hopping to save money for school. I'd lost my job and heard a tip from some crust punk about picking weed in the West Coast in the summer. I had just enough money for some decent boots to get started and been panhandling until I reached California. I began taking photos on my phone, posting them through Wi-Fi to a blog I started about the road. A few people like my posts now and then, not many, but Audrey was one of them. She messaged me one day, not pressing for any crazy details on why I was doing all this. Mostly, we just talked about movies. She'd never seen the children's hour, which was like unbelievable to me because it was this classic film starring Audrey Hepburn, one of, one of the first lesbian films that anyone admitted was about that. And my Audrey was just as shocked. I'd never seen Thelma and Louise, but I mean... Audrey was jealous of me for being out. Her dad was a Bible thumper who thought his daughter never had a boyfriend because she, because she was chaste. I was jealous that Audrey was getting an arts degree in Missouri, a state that I could actually stop in pretty easily on my way to California. The closest I could get to her was a BNSF line a few miles from the Red Bridge Motel. She agreed to meet me here tonight, but as the shower gets lukewarm, I'm not holding out hope. I get out and dry off, checking my phone. Sure enough, she texts, my dad saw our messages. He just thinks I'm talking to a stranger. He doesn't know, but he's still freaking out. Maybe tomorrow? Like I said, I'm not holding out hope. I told her I was going to stay the weekend already, and of course I lied, saying that it was just for me to rest, not to see her. But I go to bed, ready to leave by checkout. The motel phone next to the bed rings early in the morning. The manager says there's a package for me. At the front desk, he gives me the stink eye and, and hands me a box from Amazon. In white letters on a blue label, it says same-day shipping. I go into the room and open it up. It's a DVD of Thelma and Louise with a gift note on the packing slip. I read that, then jump into the shower again, this time to get ready. Thank you so much. <laughs> Eric, it was beautiful to hear your work, and I know it was an honor to have the both of you on our stage. So thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> One more time. <laughs>